Um, and so what I want to do is give you a kind of crash course. Uh, it would be a bold thing to do a crash course in all of life science, so I'm going to focus on the bit that I know best, which is that DNA. Um, and then I'm going to tell you why it needs an information infrastructure, which is the Elixir project, um, which the EBI leads. So uh, just an outline who I am, uh, this crash course in DNA, some sense about why we do this, the route into medicine, and then why we need an infrastructure. And then right at the end, there's going to be a kind of fun, uh, another use of DNA. So I'm Associate Director of the European Bioinformatics Institute. Um, uh, I don't know whether you think I look young or not. I feel old. Um, I've been doing this for quite some time. Um, and uh, as Kevin said, I've been involved in the Human Genome Project, most recently the ENCODE project. Um, the EBI is uh, in Hingston. For, for everybody, for non-Brits, that basically means Cambridge. Um, and we've worked out that that's, that's the best way to describe where we are. And e EBI is part of EMBL, and a, it's not quite a perfect mapping, but a reasonable way to think about EMBL is the, is the European um, molecular equivalent of CERN. So it's an international treaty organization which brings scientists across Europe to, in fact, five locations around Europe to do excellent science in molecular biology. So what is molecular biology, for the people who, who don't know this, is the study of how life works at a molecular level. Um, so how our cells work really genuinely down to atoms um, and then going up, out, up and out from atoms. And there's some key molecules, and I've just given you some, some analogies at the end here. So DNA is a key molecule. It's actually really like the hard drive of your computer. In other words, it's very inert. Things only get read from it, in fact, um, and, and copied wholesale. Far more active molecule is RNA. RNA is very, very similar to DNA, but it's like the volatile memory. So when you copy things off DNA, you move it to RNA first. Sometimes, in fact, that RNA does stuff, um, but certainly it's just a, a really key transformer, information transformer. The, um, what we are, um, besides 70% water, is mainly proteins. Those are the business end of a living organism. So those are the things that make your muscles move, that uh, transform light, um, into energy and leaves. All of that is executed by proteins. Um, but there's some other very, very key small molecules um, which kind of do both the energy transfer uh, inside of these things, but also some signaling and some other components. So those four molecule types are our are, are big set of molecules. And we have great theories about how these interact, how DNA makes RNA makes protein, how the different proteins fold up about all of that. But those theories don't predict what they are. I can't write down like physics and say, right, this is how human DNA should look like. There's, there's nothing, the theory doesn't support sort of instantiation at that level. And so what we have to do is we have to determine these attributes of these molecules at very often incredibly large scale, and then we have to store them, and then we retrieve those things from those databases. And molecular biology was kind of gifted, I think, in the sciences of 30 years ago when the scientists realized that this was the, the task ahead of them. They decided to make sure that their archives were global um, and open. And so we have had this tradition of globally open, globally accessible archives. And uh, when I talk to other scientists, there's this kind of a little bit of a weird moment where they say, yeah, 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 we're having all this problem sharing. And, I spend my time going, but then you all just put everything into one database, and you go, no, and you go, well, why not? Uh, and uh, so that's uh, the molecular biology people. I think it's really just a gift of, of the previous generation of scientists' foresight to just have the cultural norm as we're going to put everything in a globally accessible database, and everybody can use it. So now I'm going to focus on one molecule type. It's DNA. It's the molecule that I love the most. This, this talk could, could be multiplied by four, at the very least, for each of those other molecule types. So please don't think that DNA is incredibly important relative to proteins. If I was a structural biologist like my boss, Janet, she would tell you all about protein structures. So DNA is a, is a very simple polymer. Um, it's a covalently linked polymer that comes in two antiparallel strands. And those two antiparallel strands are bonded by hydrogen bonds. And uh, 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 they, that I've drawn out some of the chemical structure here. And the polymer is made of only four monomers. 
And so rather than us having to write down the chemical structure longhand all the time, we give those four monomers, four letters, A, T, G, and C, and we write down a string like this. So this is a representation now of a very long molecule that's in all of our bodies at the moment. Um, and it's a very small bit. Um, and the important thing to, to realize, I come onto this, is in each one of our cells, there are three times 10 to the nine um, uh, monomers in a specific sequence uh, that somehow is the hard disk for our cells. So back in the 70s, this rather gifted man who got two Nobel Prizes um, invented a way of determining part of that polymer. Uh, and that's called sequencing. Um, and you could only determine 500 letters at a time. And then over the years, the technology for this has increased um, again and again. And this is plotting on the uh, x-axis here is uh, dates. And on the y-axis is the logarithm of determining a certain amount of DNA sequence. And so at the top, you can see it says $10,000. At the bottom, it's below $1. So notice it's a logarithmic scale. The straight line here is the doubling time for chips. Okay, It's the doubling time for how well your chip improves over time. And this is the DNA line. And you can see we all got very excited in the middle of 2007 um, because DNA got cheaper by about, it halved in price every six months. Now I'll give a story of Dave Adams, who's an experimental colleague of mine who works in mice. He got a grant at about the beginning of 2007, and it was to sequence a bunch of mice, and he used half of his consumable budgets um, to sequence mice. He was then left with half of his consumable budget, and so he did it again. He used half of that to sequence another bunch of mice, and again. Now, apparently, he has an infinite consumables budget uh, 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 for this uh, set of projects. Though you can see that this did change the shape uh, at the end. Now, this is great for science. This is absolutely wonderful. We can do things that we just, you know, I, my student casually sequences seven Drosophila just for the hell of it. Okay? Uh, and it was really mad and big and crazy 10 years ago. Um, it also gives people like us, data archivists, a real headache. This is the flip of this chart, showing now the increase in DNA sequence. These lines, by the way, it's another logarithmic chart. Dates on the bottom. This is log of the number of bases. You can sort of think of them as bytes. And you can see the two red lines are, are behaving quite well. They're underneath its 12-month and 18-month doubling time. But the green line, which is next generation reads, has a much higher attack. It is doubling between six to nine months. Now, it doesn't take a genius to look at this graph and say, oh my god, uh, we're in trouble. Um, uh, all of our consumables budget is going to be taken up by disk soon. Um, but in fact, there's a way of, of dealing with this, which is uh, data-specific compression. Um, and we can, we can live with data uh, the, by, by using data-specific compression. So this is, think of JPEGs for images. Now we're going to do the, the, the moral equivalent of JPEGs, but for DNA sequence. And that allows us to scale for this. And in this talk, I'm afraid I don't have time to go into it, but my blogs are there, and we've published papers on this. Um, so it's a really impressive fact that all of life, except for one or two little twiddly things, all of life has DNA as its store. <coughs> so the incredible diversity of life still always has those same molecules. And to be honest, the rules of those molecules, although they differ a little bit, they really don't differ by much across all of life. So I've pointed out some E. coli. Um, it has 10 to the 6 uh, letters. Yeast, another 10 to the 6. My favorite fish, uh, which is just shy of 10 to the 9. Um, but we are here, humans, 3 times 10 to the 9. And don't think we've got the most amount of DNA. You've got these crazy things like white pines. They have an insane amount of DNA. Um, and so now, if you do, if you study living things, you can now sequence its DNA, and you can use the DNA for all manner of things, about working out what's in your ocean or your food or what have you, and you can study how things have evolved or how things have distributed across the planet. So, um, so uh, the, the shift now in, in molecular biology 
is that we now go to where the bottleneck is in analysis, not in uh, what it, the old bottleneck used to be, what is in your freezer, what reagents do I have to do something with, and now that the, the bottleneck mainly is, what am I going to do for the analysis of this thing? So I'm now going to hopefully zip through a little bit about what happened in the last decade in human. So um, back at uh, about a decade ago, uh, the human genome, we sort of sequenced one person. And over the last decade, we have sequenced a lot more. Um, it's over a thousand people now. Um, and we have uh, done sequencing on the cheek, which is called genotyping, on a really huge amount, something like probably half a million people now. And from that, we know all sorts of things. One of them, for example, is the out of Africa uh, hypothesis is really, really clearly true. Um, but very interestingly, the people who left Africa interbred, uh, everybody who left Af Africa interbred with Neanderthals a very little bit, uh, or, or rather somebody obviously interbred quite a bit uh, with Neanderthals, uh, but there weren't many of those people who interbred with uh, Neanderthals. And then very interestingly, the people who ended up populating Papua New Guinea and Australia um, uh, they had a, a, a more serious uh, uh, interbreeding moment with uh, a group of archaic humans who, who certainly lived in the Urals, because that's where we found their finger bone, called Denisovans. And so we now know a lot more about human history um, uh, from a genetic perspective. But we did that, not, I mean, that's all fun and interesting, but the reason why we went up uh, and did this is, is for uh, understanding disease. And there's a really simple thing you can do with uh, DNA, is you can measure something, and here I'm measuring, or some, not me, my colleague is measuring um, HDL, uh, good cholesterol, that's what you might call it. And so here are, are some measurements of HDL. And then here's one place in the human genome where the letter is either G or A. And because, of course, we have one chromosome, one copy, we, we both get two copies, one from our mum and one from our dad, at this place, everyone in this room is either GG, both Gs uh, from your mum and your dad, AA, both your, both your mum and dad gave you an A, or your AG uh, in the middle. And in this case, you can see, I hope, that there's a trend line between uh, this genotype and this phenotype. Now that means, because th there is something to do with this place in DNA with HDL, uh, um, um, uh, good cholesterol, uh, and uh, there's some statistics. The statistics is actually not that challenging, except for the fact that the genome is a very, very big place. And so you're going to do lots and lots of these statistical tests, and so you have to understand how to correct for the number of statistical tests you're doing. But that's quite well understood. So that's when we do it with HDL. This is a different thing here, where we did it for a disease, or somebody else did it with disease, colorectal cancer. And you can see in this case, I'm showing my own results. Um, and uh, it happens to be that I'm in the risk uh, portion of the population. So the baseline risk for colorectal cancer for men of my ethnicity is 5.6 out of 100, and I'm slightly more at risk of colorectal cancer. Now, I'm not too worried about that, um, but I suspect I might have to have a chat with the doctor at some point. Um, uh, uh, but this is the sort of disease readout that you can get. And what we're seeing at the moment is not big effects. I'll come on to this in a moment. The major thing we're discovering are lots and lots of small changes of risk. Those small changes of risk are not very predictive for any particular person, um, but they're very, very interesting in the biology that they illuminate. So they, they point out a particular place on the genome is in this case associated with colorectal cancer. And then, as Kevin mentioned, I've been involved in this project that, that had a, a big splash in publication, uh, ENCODE. Um, ENCODE is about how the, the DNA sequence works and makes, um, uh, makes a cell and, and one of us. Um, and it's, it is a very large, or let me put it a different way, it's a actually medium scale um, uh, uh, project in terms of sheer data volume. Uh, the cancer projects and the germline DNA projects are much bigger than this, but it's very, very heterogeneous. We did, there were 164 type, different types of experiments, 182 different cell types. Each one of these were done with two replicates at least, sometimes in different labs. So there was a lot of metadata to keep straight and a lot of metadata to use correctly um, in this. And I'm not going to be able to go through 
um, the different parts of ENCODE. Um, uh, this is just now some of the analysis streams that happen here. And underneath these here, you'll see these names will change because this is a consortium effort and there are many, many different people involved. And basically, the left-hand side here is where we analyze experiments one by one. We, we look at each experiment individually, and there was a new piece of statistics that was developed for this. And then on the right-hand side is when we look at experiments together, we do joint analysis of the experiments. In each case, you have to think precisely what is the statistical framework I'm going to use to do that. It changes. There isn't one statistical framework across here. Um, and you need a big diversity of, of approaches that you then pull back together again. Um, this was my favorite uh, bit done by Michael Hoffman and Jason Ernst. We, we actually took a step back from the data and we used some very unbiased machine learning techniques, a dynamic Bayesian network and a hidden Markov model, to just take the data and say, what do you, to the machine learning technique, what do you think is going on? What's very reassuring is we got out well understood, so with no training data, we didn't put any training data in, we got out well understood regions um, so these are promoters, if you're a biologist, molecular biologist, <laughs> you wouldn't be surprised to hear that there are these things called promoters in the human genome and they, they're the place where genes start. Um, and so we did that kind of a positive control. We had some really unexpected things and then we had what I described as reassuringly interesting, um, uh, which are regions that we think are controlling um, the expression of genes, but they're not at the start of genes, called enhancers. And just focusing on those, um, this is now my favorite fish, Medaka fish. Uh, this is the fish here. Its head is his embryo. The tail is going to go around here. There's his heart, and he's beating his blood around the yolk sac, extracting the nutrients from the yolk sac to make his body there. Now, what this Medaka fish has is it has a piece of human DNA that we predicted uh, is in, involved in expression in red blood cells. And it has to be that in fish, um, the red blood cells are nucleated. And so each one of those little green dots is one blood cell expressing gene for green fluorescent protein uh, from that piece of human DNA. And that's indicative that our prediction worked. It's also a very nice picture. Uh, and uh, the, the, again, the stats from this are, are good uh, for this. So this is one of these situations where we've done a whole bunch of analysis, we've made some predictions, we've taken those predictions back into the lab to show that those predictions are reasonably good, or good. Now, um, why are we doing this? Um, so one of it, for scientists, is, is for a love of trying to understand why, how these things work. For, for charities and for taxpayers, it's usually because we are one of these things, and if we can understand how we work, and more importantly, how we go, how we don't work, we can improve human health. And it's very, very exciting to me because I'm suddenly now um, got many, many more clinical contacts than I used to have. Um, so there are three big areas where where we expect molecular biology generally and DNA specifically to to, to impact. One is germline risk to disease. Another one is cancer, and a third one is uh, pathogens. And, and in the in the in the developed world, that's often about hospital acquired infections, MRSA, and friends. So this is actually the area that I know uh, the best. Um, as I mentioned, um, there's a there's a big set of diseases, and we all have a little differential change in risk of disease. So we all bump around and your, co your colorectal cancer risk may be a little bit higher, your type 2 diabetes may be a bit lower, your something like that. But there is perhaps 1% in the population that has a striking change of risk of disease, um, a really tenfold difference in disease. And these are some of these people just die of sudden heart attacks. Um, um, and this is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You get these big hearts, you know, the footballer who kind of collapsed, who Quite possibly he had HCM, I don't actually know, but that is the kind of phenotype for this. And so what's quite interesting is we're trying to put together the framework to, to identify these people before they show their phenotypic changes by genotype. Uh, now there's quite a lot of ethics to this, and then there's quite a lot of money aspect to this, um, but this is feasible, and because you're preventing people from having heart attacks, it's actually quite cost effective. Um, so in other words, heart attacks, and in particular, it's actually not the heart attack, which is expensive, it's the post 
heart attack care, which is the really expensive thing. So if you can stop people from having heart attacks, it's obviously good for them. Also saves your healthcare system money. Um, this is uh, uh, um, uh, another set of diseases, cancer. Cancer is very much is a collection of diseases. They're very, very different diseases. Breast cancer is very different from prostate cancer. It's very different from brain cancer. But a very common aspect to them is that they have genetic changes to the DNA. The cancer cell, the, the, the hard disk of the cell has gone, has had an error, and that error is making it divide inappropriately. Now, the interesting thing is you can sequence the cancer genome, and you can define the, the, the things which are different between the cancer and the normal. To do that, you also always need to sequence the normal, the individual person, so you need to get two genomes, the cancer and the normal. You show the differences, and that gives you a new way to classify cancers. Now, not only by where it came from or how it looks like down the microscope, but what things are different in the DNA. And in this case here, there's a drug which only works if there's a particular form, uh, uh, um, DNA form. So I don't have the highlights here. If you haven't seen these plots, these are survival curves. This is time after the start of treatment. It goes out to 24 months here. And this is the proportion of the people on the trial that uh, have survived. And the gray lines in the back are the control set. The black line is when we consider everybody on this drug together. And you can see this black line doesn't seem to do too much different to the control, though seeing these two lines cross is very interesting. But then B and C are the same as this A line, this black line, but split by whether the cancer genome had a particular mutation. And you can see in B, when it does have a mutation, gosh, this drug really does work. In C, if it doesn't have this mutation, this drug seriously does not work. Okay? This drug actually has to be, um, the license they got for this drug, unsurprisingly, says you must test the cancer genome before you give this drug. Because this drug only works if the cancer genome has this uh, mutation. But this is just one drug on one cancer. <coughs> We have lots and lots of different drugs and lots and lots of different cancers. And what is going on at the moment is producing the research base to say, right, which drug to which type of cancer, and now that which type of cancer is defined molecularly, not necessarily by where it comes from. Um, and then pathogens, um, uh, the sequencing uh, provides a clear cut diagnosis of pathogens, but it also provides transmission. So when you see an MRSA outbreak, very often you might have two MRSA outbreaks in a hospital separated by two to three months. An interesting question is whether the second outbreak is really the same as the first, but just had a sort of uh, a slow period, or whether you've really got two different outbreaks. And that might change a lot of things about how you treat and how you think about that disease. It also will, when somebody's infected, it will say to you definitively this person has got this particular infection. But rather than doing this at the point of infection, the point of phenotypes, you can think one step further, and you can think about surveying environments, i.e. the hospital floors or regions or asymptomatic people, um, uh, nursing staff, uh, and to see w what is carrying the infection around the hospital and whether a particular room, nobody may be infected, but there may be, for example, C. difficile in that room at, the, at this moment, and you may want to change your protocol for this. So I'll finish um, uh, for uh, infrastructure uh, components. So, um, uh, so just to mention, um, when we think about infrastructure, there's very often a, a thought about how the physical infrastructure that you need. Um, so, for example, uh, this was the physical infrastructure in terms of disk, in terms of compute, and, and in terms of bandwidth or encode. But I actually think those are the problems which are the easiest to solve. Uh, certainly, high energy physics has a bigger problem than biology by about one order of magnitude, just one order of magnitude these days. Um, and, and, and these things are very easy to quantify and, and say, right, if we want to do this piece of science, this is what we need. Um, but what is much more, I think, critical and, and a harder thing is an information infrastructure. And I just want to remind you that infrastructures are critical and we rely on them. Um, so a snowy weather moment makes you think about Schiphol Airport. Yeah? Um, 
uh, uh, but most of the time we do not worry about them. So I bet none of you um, uh, yesterday on Sunday rang the Netherlands uh, Electricity Board to say, you know, excuse me, uh, I'm traveling to the Netherlands tomorrow and I'm just wondering whether you're going to be supplying electricity. Because if you're not supplying electricity to Amsterdam, I'm pretty sure my conference is going to not happen. I'm, I don't want to get on the plane. All right? We all made the assumption that the electricity was going to work in Amsterdam. That, that was not a worry for us. And in the same way, effective infrastructures you know, kind of raise the bar for scientists and allow them not to worry about a certain class of things. And so unfortunately, you only really notice infrastructures when they go wrong and you get stuck in the airport, or the electricity fails, or what have you. And so, as an infrastructure provider, there's a very weird business. You only get noticed when you get shouted at. Nobody pats you on the back and says, you know that DNA archive that's been running for 30 years? Just brilliant that it's still running. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you know, I couldn't do my science without it. That is not what people come to you and say. And it's in fact this information infrastructure which I think is much more important than the physical infrastructure. It's at least harder to express to people without some care. And so these are the information infrastructures that we need in biology, about the DNA, about proteins, about 3D structures, about where things are expressed in cells. Um, but this keeps on going. There is a remarkable amount of life out there. And every single species that we care about, we, we care about, we want an infrastructure. We have a, a big driver of medicine that I mentioned. We need to improve our chemical understanding. And so when you think about provisioning such an infrastructure, you can think about a centralized model or, or a fully distributed model. Centralized model is a bit like an American approach. This is how the Americans have done it. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's, there's a, there's a big single place that you can talk about, the stability, reuse, but it's hard to concentrate the expertise here, and there's a geographic and language placement of this problem. The other model is a very, very distributed process where you're funding a very small number of people uh, across this, and maybe those funding comes in episodic uh, scenarios. This is more responsive, more geographically language responsive, but there's, it's, there's a big overhead in communication, and it's much, much harder to provide multi-decade um, uh, propagation of this, because in particular if this network has to go and get itself refunded with a different configuration every five years. It's just not a very effective way of doing this. And so we really strongly believe that the right scientific solution to this is a network, a, a robust network with a strong hub. And the hub um, is the EBI for us, for the, for the molecular biology area, and these different nodes, this network is Elixir, and these nodes would be placed not at the EBI. A lot of people, so this aligns very well with European politics, and a lot of people think that the reason why we've created this structure is because of European politics, but that is not, in my view, the right mentality. It happens to work well with European politics. But this is the right scientific structure for this kind of infrastructure. And I really know Hingston is a very small village outside of Cambridgeshire. And there is no way that we will get all the scientists with the right expertise to move to this small village and live there and, and generate all of these things. We need to have a diversity of scientists but that are working in a very coherent network that has multi-decade stability. And that's what the um, Elixir project is, to build a sustainable European infrastructure for biological information. It is led by the EBI, but we are first among equals, if, if perhaps not even first. If there was somebody from Switzerland here, he would be saying, no, oh, just, we're just one happy crew. And, uh, and that's very true. Um, and it has a lot of, you know, good impacts for medicine and the environment and uh, what, what's called white biotech uh, are the three big drivers. So I will skip over this just to mention in biology there are many other um, infrastructures that are being built, but I, I pick out Eurobioimaging, which is, which is about the, the imaging processes, which is another big driver to biology. So now for, for just for two or three minutes, yeah, 
Uh, Kevin's moaning. Uh, uh, this is a just for fun moment. So this is one of those great moments uh, that starts in a pub and ends up the letter to nature. All right? So you, you've got to love this. Um, so uh, after a long day talking about data archiving, um, my colleague, mathematician, um, uh, Nick, was looking at all of these curves and saying, we uh, uh, are going to be storing everything. All of our storage is going to be dedicated to DNA. We really need to think about fundamental properties of storage density. And so jokingly, I can't remember which one of us said, of course, the most cost-effective way of doing this would be to actually store it as DNA. Yeah? Um, so this is to think of DNA now as a digital medium. It's going to be a replacement for tape. Right? You're going to make DNA, and you're going to put it in a little thing, and you're going to put it away somewhere instead of tape. And so we, we did it. Um, and in particular, we created a codec. So there's two problems to solve. One is that you can't synthesize very, very long bits of DNA. And so you have to synthesize in chunks. And so your codec, your, your system needs to think about how to do that. Um, and we were able to, to create a system that did that. Um, uh, it's, it's, that's not so hard. And then the other thing is that we know quite a lot about the error properties of either making DNA or reading DNA. And so we made a codec that was very specifically excluded the most common form of error in both reading and uh, uh, writing uh, DNA. So now we have... Uh, and then we had lots of redundancy, and you could do this, at, 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 you could layer on some other codecs on top of that, uh, but we have a very robust codec. And we know, Svante Pavo in Leipzig, they sequence K-fair DNA, 5,000-year-old uh, K-fair DNA, every week, totally routine. And so with no electricity, as long as it's cold, dry, and dark, you can keep DNA for up to 5,000 years at least um, uh, uh, and retrieve it. So this is digital archiving in a multi-century uh, uh, kind of context, okay? Um, and uh, so in our, you, you know, you have to, uh, so we kind of fool around. This is all thought experiments, but it's kind of fun. Would our, would our system scale? Um, will our codex scale? And this is, a, this is a plot of the codex scaling, and, and it's a log scale here. Rather amazingly, this is three zettabytes on this thing, the estimated global data amount now. Um, and that would be a, um, it would be about a tons of DNA, a metric ton of DNA, okay? which is a, an imaginable amount. It would be, though, hideously expensive to synthesize at the moment. Um, and so now if you think about uh, setting this up as a cost, uh, as an economic analysis, the really interesting thing about DNA is that you don't need any running costs for it, um, uh, except perhaps a security guard, interestingly, at Svalberg, the global seed bank, or seed vault, um, they have this seed vault of all these seeds, and they have no guards. The guards are polar bears, okay? So they just have a, a room in Svalbard, and, you, and once you're there, the assumption is, is that you, you want it to be there, um, and you're going to go in. <laughs> um, so so uh, every other archiving material that we know of requires some amount of maintenance. Uh, certainly tape does, and so we built an economic model, um, and on the right-hand side here are scenarios where the DNA storage is, is less expensive, and the left-hand side is when the tape is less expensive, and here is the, the, the two parameters, is really the cost of DNA synthesis, which is the y-axis here, and then this is the, the amount of time you're going to archive for. This top area here is where we think we are in terms of current costs. And we are somewhere, we're cost effective if you take a 1,000 to 5,000 year time scale. So if your funding agency comes to you and says, could you store something okay, for 1,000 years, you can say, oh, I know a man who can do this. <laughs> yeah. And it's cost effective. Yeah? It's just that all the costs are front loaded. Yeah? Uh, uh, they'll probably, it probably won't fly. Um, yeah? But uh, if DNA synthesis gets cheaper, then possibly we're in the zone. So it's probably got to get 100-fold cheaper. Uh, DNA synthesis costs is halving in price every three to five years. So it's not so bad. Um, and by the way, this economic model does cope with the fact that we assume that tapes get cheaper over time. Um, so there's some fixed cost. It's really the fixed cost of moving tape media 
uh, which, is, which is the thing that drives us. So uh, that was just for fun. Uh, if, you want to, if, if you're now worried about digitally archiving into a century level, you can, you can be reassured that it's, it's at least physically feasible. So I, I mentioned I talk a little bit about ENCODE. I get a lot of credit for ENCODE, but, but it's 410 authors. I'm just one of those 410 authors, and I don't deserve even the majority of the credit. Two individuals, Ian Dunham, uh, who worked with me at the EBI, and Anshal Kunchai, who worked at Stanford, had a disproportionate impact on this paper. And these individuals, which are the lead postdocs um, for each of the areas that made the data, um, got far less, they, they, for the amount of effort and sweat and, and, and care they put in, they probably get the least credit uh, compared to that. So these are the people who make the ENCODE data really work. If you want to know how you do chip seek on 110 different antibodies and they go mad, you talk to Flo uh, Pauli, for example, uh, and each one of those deserves a huge amount of credit. If you meet someone and they said, I was the data production postdoc for ENCODE, congratulate them. Uh, round there. And this was funded uh, by NIH and NHGRI, this project. Um, and I'm, I'm ready for questions, and you can follow me on Twitter, and I blog, and I update on um, Google Plus uh, occasionally as well, so you can follow me socially uh, as well. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>